Good evening and welcome to our educator speaker series with Susie Lee and Geishi Tupton Dorji. My name is Tiffany Harris. I'm the director of school programs here at Crystal Bridges. And tonight we have a great conversation lined up for you. And before we begin, I want to mention that the live transcription and closed captioning are available for those that are interested at the bottom part of your screen. Please also use the chat function to share your thoughts throughout the speaking engagement. To start, we want to ask you how you're feeling today and where are you at? So feel free to populate the chat now with your thoughts and we will take a look at those before we get started. I also want to read our land acknowledgement. I want to take this time to an opportunity to acknowledge and pay respect to the Osage, Caddo, and Quapaw people and elders past, present, and future. We acknowledge and offer deep gratitude to the ancestral land and water that supports us as we gather here today. I have the pleasure tonight of introducing our moderator, Donald O'Donohue. Donald is an endowed professor and director of graduate studies at, in art education at the University of Arkansas, Arkansas School of Art. At the University of Arkansas, he conducts research on contemporary art, curatorial practice, and education with a particular interest in contemporary arts, pedagogical potential and capacity to function as a mode of scholarly inquiry. Please join me in welcoming Donald. Donald? Well, thank you so much, Tiffany, for, for those kind words. And thank you for inviting me to moderate this conversation this evening. It is such an honor and a privilege to do so. I'm coming to all of you from my office here at the University of Arkansas, and I know that you are coming to this conversation from across the state, um, from across the country, and even internationally. So I'd like to begin by extending my thanks to you, who've taken the time this evening to join us, um, and to join us in, in what will be a conversation, as Tiffany said, between artist Susie J. Lee and Tibetan Buddhist monk Jeshe Tupton. Um, Dorji La. The conversation will focus on some of the concepts and ideas that matter to them and to the work that they do. But before I turn to my first task as moderator, which is to introduce our distinguished speakers and then to explain this evening's session and how it will be structured, I'd like to take this moment to acknowledge the vision and commitment of the Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art School programs, and especially Tiffany, for creating spaces such as these, spaces in which we can witness and engage in conversations with artists and educators who have been recognized for their contributions to their own fields of study and practice and to other fields also. So this event this evening then is designed with educators in mind. And it is a lovely opportunity to witness how one artist and one scholar think, make, interpret, and bring us into an understanding of certain ideas and concepts. And Susie and Geshe will do that in conversation with one another and with you as audience members, as they share perspectives on their practices, their ways of working and thinking, and the assumptions that shape the work that they do. I suppose you could say there is something very special about a conversation, whether one participates in it, whether one overhears it, or whether one observes it unfold. Within a conversation, there is always the promise of finding something that we have not yet discovered, of recognizing something that is present, but might have gone unnoticed and of saying something that has not been said in that way before. So now I'd like to turn to my first task and introduce our distinguished speakers. And then, as I mentioned a moment ago, I will briefly explain how this evening session will be structured. I should say before I begin that my introductions this evening will be rather brief. If you'd like to learn more about our speakers, who they are, what they do, what they have accomplished and what some of their current projects are, I would recommend that you take a look at the Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art website where their biographies are posted. So I'm so pleased to first introduce Susie J. Lee. Susie is a multimedia artist, software entrepreneur, 
and single mother raising her four-year-old. Her works have been shown in exhibitions across the world, and the Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art has several of her video portraits in its collection. Those of you who have been to the museum would have likely sat with her video portrait, Johnny, from her project, The Fracking Fields. Susie now lives in Taiwan with her daughter for her startup, Catapult, which helps people create their own video stories. I'm equally pleased to introduce Geshe Tupton Dorji. Geshe is a colleague of mine here at the University of Arkansas. He is a professor in the Fulbright College of Arts and Sciences. And Geshe has pursued academic studies in Asia and in the West, and has set up several Dharma centers in North America. In 1986, Geshe was ordained a Buddhist monk by His Holiness the Dalai Lama. So welcome, Susie, and welcome, Geshe. Um, this evening, then, our speakers will focus on and talk about three concepts, time and impermanence as one concept, interdependent origination as another, and enthusiasm as the third. They will reflect on how each of these three concepts shows up, plays out, takes form, or becomes manifest in their work. And they will invite you as audience members to reflect on how thinking with concepts serves as a particular approach to making art, to interpreting art, and to talking about art. Of course, you could also say perhaps that thinking with concepts is also a way to approach designing and making curriculum, as it is a way of creating conditions for young people and others to come into the company of ideas, practices, and processes. So our plan this evening then is to devote about 25 minutes to a discussion of each concept, beginning with the concept of time and impermanence. So in other words, um, what, what's gonna happen, I guess, is that we will have three primary segments to our session. At the beginning of each segment, Geshe will share some opening remarks on the concept that he's introducing focusing on what it means to him and to his work. Then Susie will enter into conversation with Geshe and the conversation will grow from there in a somewhat organic manner. But like all good conversations, this one this evening also encourages you as participants to contribute, to share some of your questions, your curiosities, your thoughts and comments. So we're hoping for an interactive um, conversation um, um, this evening during this event. So therefore, we ask you to share, as Tiffany said a moment ago, your questions, your comments, and your curiosities in the chat function or in the question and answer function of this webinar. We really do want to encourage you to post some comments and to post some of your thoughts and questions in response to the conversation um, that you will hear as you're listening to it. And I'll share some of those questions and comments in my role as moderator with Susie and Geshe for their response um, as part of our event. So with that said, now I would like to turn it over to Susie to begin the evening by sharing with us some of her work and also perhaps to offer some remarks about the nature and focus of this session from her perspective and also why she wished to enter into conversation with Geshe. So welcome, Susie. Thanks, Donald, and thanks, Tiffany. Thanks, Geshe. Um, and thank you, everyone, for coming in at the end of your day, at the end of a week, at uh, probably the end of a, close to the end of a semester to come and join us. Um, I look forward to being able to see your comments and chats and uh, joining in this conversation. So as Donald said, uh, you know, there are works that the museum have that uh, have inspired this conversation. And so I wanted to just quickly share what those works are if you aren't familiar with them. Uh, just one moment. Uh, so these are uh, uh, video portraits. These are three examples of the video portraits that are at the Crystal Bridges Museum. 
They're photographs right here, but they are videos in the museum. Um, when you sit with them, at first you might think that they're a framed photograph, but then if you sit with them a little bit longer, you'll see that they move and then they breathe and that they just, they, they are. And they you sit with them as if you are watching each other quietly and trying to understand each other. So this project originated because around 2008, uh, the recession had hit the United States and the rest of the world quite hard. And fracking was something that was suddenly happening in my home state of North Dakota. I hadn't really been back to North Dakota in 20 years. So coming back and trying to reconcile the childhood memories I had with the sudden change that fracking was now imposing onto the small towns uh, was something that I was deeply curious about. Um, one of the things that I was very clear on was that I know I, you might have remembered there was a lot of uh, press about the fracking industry at this time, um, a lot of negative press about it because, of course, there's a lot of the environmental impact and damage to it. Um, but I came in to the state as an artist and not as a journalist. And therefore, there was a kind of freedom and ability to talk to people and connect with people that many of the individual oil workers had already shut down to outsiders because they just didn't trust and they felt that they had, uh, you know, any connection that they had sort of met was, uh, was burned at that point in time. So when I said I was an artist and I was interested in hearing their stories and understanding where they came from, they were like, why? why do you care about my story? Like, I'm just a regular average person. Um, and I said, I think it's really important to elevate those kind of stories. I think that it matters what you're doing and whatever people talk about in terms of their own position about the actual act of fracking, um, we also all recognize that we have energy needs and that you are part of that um, narrative. So, um, so we had these conversations and as we were, um, as we were uh, discussing with Tiffany about the themes uh, for tonight, I said, you know, there's, there's sort of a few things that really resonate with me when I, when I was doing the portraits and then also uh, now today. Um, and if we're going to have this conversation today, I feel like we need to acknowledge <laughs> this very singular time that we feel like we're in uh, with the pandemic, with all of the racial reckonings, um, and with a lot of the stress that people have in their lives at this point that, the, uh, that this time has accelerated. Um, so I said, you know, there's, there's, there's time and everything's changing. So the portraits themselves, you know, you have to sit with them, right? When you sit with them and you spend a little time, a lot of people and a lot of viewers have said, I feel like I know someone like that, or I feel like I know the person that's actually in that portrait. Um, and when they describe sort of what they feel like the person's personality is just by sitting with the portraits, um, it actually oftentimes fits very well with the person that I got to know um, when I was doing the portraits. Um, I, in order to create the portraits, uh, I don't just sit with them. I actually spend uh, a good amount of time before then. And I think that that trust and connection that you have with someone and that you can exchange stories um, is really important. So that when we are actually sitting and recording the portraits, um, there's a certain kind of energy that we have. And I think a lot of the educators out there who work with students, um, you're masters at understanding how to shape that energy between you and, uh, and other people. Um, and Geshe uh, um, does this really, really well as well. So, um, so I feel like this idea of time um, and things changing, not only for the subjects in, my, in the video portraits, but also the time that we're living in now was particularly resonant, as well as this idea of connecting to um, people in a way that can be unexpected. Um, and that can be uh, deeply meaningful and really change people's lives. Um, so I'll just share uh, before I uh, transfer over, um, when the portraits were uh, up in the museum at first in the North Dakota Museum of Art, um, I told all of the, uh, the people who had been part of the portraits and I said, please come and see the show. And uh, one of them said, I'm gonna call my mom. 
And, you know, these are like some of the biggest and strongest and burliest guys. And it was like so touching to have this person like, oh, hang on, wait a second. I'm going to call my mom right now. Um, and the pride that he had to be able to say that he had done this project and that he was now in, in a, you know, his portrait was part of a museum, um, I think really uh, was really touching. Um, so tonight I felt that this conversation should be anchored um, by someone who I think really um, has practiced uh, and understood these themes deeply. Um, and so when I talked to Tiffany about who that kind of person was, um, I kept coming back to this idea that's, that religion is probably one of the most powerful and impactful ways uh, that humans have had to harness this idea of understanding change and also understanding how to connect and relate to people. And so though, even though I'm not religious, um, I feel like as an artist, one of the privileges, one of the great privileges I have is to have a freedom that's oftentimes outside of the typical narratives of life. And so I said to Tiffany, let's try to find somebody um, whose life and practices embodies understanding the idea of change, um, letting go of certain things, holding on to certain things, uh, deeply connecting to the world and to people. Um, and then also, uh, I guess you added this idea of enthusiasm. So with that, I would love to uh, switch over to Geshi, who, when we've had our conversations before this uh, night, um, I always feel like when we were sort of trying to connect and see how we would uh, arrange this evening, I would always walk away thinking, yeah, I just learned something from that session, right? Um, and, uh, and so I hope that uh, all of you will also be able to do that. So Geshi, I'd like to turn it over to you right now. Um, and I'm so pleased and honored to be able to have met you through this and connect with you. Thank you, thank you, Susie. I'm going to, let me set up my presentation. And first I want to say thank you to Krista Bridge, Christ, uh, Bridge and uh, all, Wilton families to have a wonderful museum in Northwest Arkansas, which is whole world's enjoying very much. Second, I want to thank you for Tiffany. She worked very hard. The third is our IT and person and Kim, she did a good job. Also, I'm thank you for my colleagues in particular this uh, session here. Today, uh, let me introduce you this. Um, as Tibetan, as me as a Tibetan, um, if you condense the level all culture, heritage, Tibetan tradition, everything comes together known as the five major sciences, art, craft, medicine, grammar, logic and a philosophy. These are wonderful five major sciences. Also, also they are a minor science too, but we need to talk about it now. However, these are introduced to Tibet to India, seventh century, say early seventh century to late eighth century round. And this introduced from the beginning with the oral tradition, which is a Tibetan majority, 90% Tibetan people cannot read and write. But this thing is taught to monasteries to pass down to lay Tibetan people with the art, craft, dancing, drama. As you see in the side here, a picture of those. And uh, see here, this is the medicine. These two are the medicine. Here is Tibetan and you know, Goramaru's writing readings, everything philosophy explained here, Tibetan metaphysic level, a love styles. Then there are another drawing or art or craft. Everything these things taught into oral tradition. I remember I was exiled in India, I mean Bhutan, age 45 as all. My mama and our fellow Tibetans are doing about road construction. As me, as a child, we set aside by a road, study all those art, could have dance and drama, side by a road. 
later we becoming Tibetan settlement in Pismon Bhutan. Then I moved to 72, the South India for continually study this tradition. Same as I come to United States since mid and mid nineties to under this level. Yes, our surrounding by Western students, I'm teaching here almost 15, 20 years, university colleges in here, United States of America. And these are literally illiterate Tibetan writing, reading, grammar, history, et cetera, et cetera. But these things we need to taught them, art and craft, dance and drama is bridge to introduce people are illiterate people. You don't have to be know how to read and how to write. Every single art that you create, you're living life as a day in and day out. Everything taught into this, introduced through from art and craft, dance and drama, such like mindful meditation, life and compassion, each single of these can be taught through from art and craft, dance and drama. That's how Tibetans are educated. Yes, they are illiterate, but they're educated. Same as here, since I've been in the United States, I'm teaching university colleges. There's a lot to do, teach other people how to, they can learn appreciation for their art or craft, living with it and harmony within the what you create with the right motivation, love and compassion, mindful meditation. These things are practically we can apply into. And particularly with our ties on ancient tradition like this, our message, it can be becoming a shallow concept. You have to go back to the root. That's I stick to myself in in my life, these things taught me, these things have changed my life. These things are what I do in the day in and day out in the universities, colleges, and uh, even I teach in here uh, in a women's jail, and also I teach up to kindergarten to public you know, places. I do have a couple of centers, I teach them through from mindful meditation, Buddhist time, Buddhist philosophy, everything through from art and crab, dance and drama. Let me back to, you know, Kim, what do you wanna talk about in subject matters the next one in four minutes? Kim? Maybe I can step in, Geshe. So if you'd like to move on to introducing the first concept, that would be terrific. So that would be time and impermanence. Okay, let me say then, you know, of course, concept of the impermanence is very important. The concept of impermanence is very important. Let me say why. Doesn't matter who we are, we have the concept of attachment is issue. Only way to you can understand attachment or anything misabuse that we feel like you've been stuck to uh, anything circumstances. These things introduce from attachment, overcome attachment by introduction of known as impermanence. Even neuron sciences and you know, discovering known as brain plasticity. They discovered that, discovered that, and trace of the, some they consider to be fixed concept of the personality disposition begin to change. They see through the meditations, mind training can transform not only their life, also life of others. They can see these things are impermanence and this can this thing can be changed. You don't need to be stuck with the forever, that kind of concept. Really wonderful concept, impermanent is, if we accept as impermanent as change, doesn't matter who we are, we are as teacher, whether you as art, 
whether you don't believe or non believe or at all, non believing, doesn't matter what cattle or what we belong to, believe or non believer, what kinds of impermanence is very important that can help you and change your overcome short sighted mind, only concern about this life. Also, you can change again and actual does going to affect on you and and in a good way to understanding life is precious, time is precious. You can see that if you are not aware of impermanence, you will fail to take advantage of this special life, which is means impermanence, it seems like a negative, not. If you understood impermanence, you begin to understood, understood time is precious. Every second, every minute your rehab is precious because everything change secondarily manners. You cannot stuck there forever. That not say things go to permanent, not say things go to eternal. As artists, sometimes sometime we do any drawing and anything making images, nothing came out as good things you learn to be. But you learn to be learn, you need to learn to be accept changing is going to occur. If you are going to see wonderful ice, ice sculpture, first thing you need to see, time is precious. Otherwise, you're never going to see it. Secondly, changing the cut, you don't get upset because you already accept changing is natural or the phenomena. So that is impermanence. Our life since birth to die, changing is part of our life not separate entity. We are sometimes difficult. We try to assume something held down to forever. Then changing the cut, you are subject to be difficult, difficult to cope with it. They lead you becoming anger, hatred, and a lot of other negative mental factors to it. So back to concept of impermanent, it's very helpful to understanding, not only for see as precious time and energy, also your precious, everything around you, if you accept as changing the cut, is a part of you. Thank you. Let me pass down to this to the Suzy. She can explain that, what I mean by impermanence. Okay, Suzy, please. Thanks, Keishi, on that. Um... So yeah, I think at this point, uh, like having a conversation between us and being able to uh, just reflect on what this means, not only in the work, but I think also in people's classrooms and how they're navigating life, um, I feel like is, uh, is really important. So um, can we get Geishi back on too as a conversation here? Um, so, you know, I think one of the things that uh, I had said about the video portraits was that when I described what's the difference between them and say a painting or a photograph is that they are the moments after the photograph is taking, right? So everyone knows kind of the Instagram, like, okay, I made this perfect moment. And then afterwards you can do, you know, regular life. And so I said, I really wanted to be able to embody and capture this idea of what happens the moment after, and then the moment after that, and the moment after that. Um, I feel like the pandemic, has been a lot of like, okay, this is the moment. This is the moment after that, still, still here. Um, and, uh, you know, I think one of the reminders that kind of kept me sane um, was the idea of this idea of permanent impermanence that eventually things would change. Um, but on the flip side, uh, one of the things, Geishi, that we had talked about um, was there's this idea that you know, nostalgia is a really powerful thing. And I think kind of entering my midlife now and having a child, um, you look back on previous times and I think you wish that things hadn't changed from those because you realize that you had moved on from a time uh, that maybe feels sweeter or simpler or at least, uh, you know, less complicated, um, but you're now here. And so, how do you 
how do you navigate this idea of like really powerful nostalgia that I think a lot of people have um, and whether it's used for positive or more negative ways. Um, yeah, what is your feeling about that in terms of that nostalgia and impermanence? And like I said, you know, before and uh, impermanence is really powerful stuff. But a lot of people think as a negative, don't want to think about it. They feel comfortable for a whole, you know, have something held down to it. The reality is changing the cuts. Whether you are sad, whether you are a pleasure, neither way, time is changing. You miss opportunity. You miss opportunity for enjoying today's dinner. You will never get a second chance to be, go back to have a yesterday's dinner. So every second minute what you have it is precious. That help you us to overcome me. Doing this, such things are meaningless, wasting wonderful, precious life, precious time. This trash, nothing useful thing to do. For that reason, its impermanence are particularly Tibetan teachers are in the deals day one. It's a powerful motivation to appreciation for your life, appreciation for someone who provides you head to toes in your life since birth to under this level. We talk about this subject next one is called interdependent origination. I will get a more detail on that for later. So it's impermanence, the powerful concept. Then yes, there are subtle impermanence, gross impermanence. Subtle impermanence is secondary changes. Everything zigzag, zigzag manners. The gross impermanence, you can see cars crash, papa, mamas, you know, ancestors, nephews, nieces and nephews are dying. These things are gross impermanence. And we war is killing other people. These things are gross impermanence which is, means you don't have to be logically think, but you can understood. And dying is part of our life, something you have to be accept. So in this case, exception is the best way to cope with it. You know, without that, you're subject to be miserable. Like I said before, if someone walked away your life and very much dear to your life, you are subject to be miserable because you have a concept, misconception of something held down to forever. That's not going to happen. Instead of that, you learn to accept reality. That's going to help you cope with it. Sadness, anger, hatred, shame, and guiltiness, all this can, can be cured. Healing is within ourselves. You don't have to healing outside or seeking. Peace that exists within ourselves. Peace cannot seek outside of the world. So that's all about impermanence means, okay? Yeah, I feel like uh, now that I have a child that, uh, you know, I, I actually think of her as kind of the sculpture in time and that's constantly moving and morphing and changing shapes. Um, probably I think a lot of our audience members can see their students that are like that as well. Um, and so I think that the one of the most important things for me, um, uh, you know, with her is to just constantly be reminded that things will always change and that in fact, probably I'll always be one step behind her, but the main thing is to be able to change and be malleable and flexible with her. Um, and that's an important part to um, allow her to develop and flourish too, um, which is actually kind of the same when you're, you know, in the art, an artist or in the classroom, right? It's like, there's sort of that subtle impermanence where there's just these unpredictable changes and you're like, well, we're going with this thing, right? And you just kind of move on and you have to kind of like roll with the punches, right? Um, and uh, 
uh, you know, when you meet people who are not as able to roll with the punches, you, you sense a certain kind of suffering that they have, right? That they uh, are constantly resisting uh, a, this change in a way that, that is actually internally, uh, like it hurts them a bit. Um, and so I think one of the things that uh, I like to say as an artist, uh, you know, one of the things that the practice of being an artist has been able to do is allow me to be really on like comfortable in the I don't know kind of space so that when people ask me like, hey, what are you going to do next or da 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 and then I'll say, I don't know, um, I'll, I'll make a decision when I get to that point. Um, and so, you know, whatever planning you have, you also know that it comes with a caveat that there might, you know, there always will need to be a potential plan B, plan C, plan D, um, or just chuck all the plans out the window and go, yeah, we're starting something else all over again. So, um, yeah, I feel like that's a, a really important thing. Um, and we'd love to hear like what, um, you know, in terms of the audience out there, you know, chatting in and joining in about, you know, your experiences of um, uh, going through certain periods of gross impermanence as well as subtle impermanence. And then um, maybe your uh, abilities or techniques to be able to go through that. Um, and also, Geishi, how, how do you feel like, what, what are the kind of tools that people could have to actually be able to start to accept it more if there's somebody, you know, who feels like they want to improve this idea of accepting change? What are the kinds of things that people could do in their daily life um, that doesn't require them to uh, run to a monastery? One thing is that people have to develop something being put out themselves, what are done, what are accomplished. In other words, uh, rejoicing your own good deeds. That inspires yourself, also inspires other people. Or at the same time, you see surrounding people succeed. Whatever things doing, you have to be rejoicing rather than being jealous. So there are way to, many ways to you can transform the changing is a part of your life. You know, like I said before, every single surrounding phenomenon is secondarily changes. So you learn to be accept that's the fundamentally very important. Okay. Mm. Um. Or maybe it's an opportunity for me to maybe just ask a question from the audience if that's okay because i think what both of you were talking about um we have some audience members who've asked some questions that connect to what you're talking about and then perhaps if it's okay with you we'll ask you to return to the conversation again so i i apologize for jumping in but i think the that's moment good. is good right now just to take this question so one of our audience members has asked a question and framed it around the idea that life without change is death, right? That to live is to be present to change, right? And I think Susie, you spoke about it beautifully um, when you talk about your practice and, uh, and about embracing unknowability um, and rolling with unknowability. And I think you've just said, um, Geshe, a moment ago, dying is part of our life. So I'm wondering if based on the question that we have, and I, and I haven't elaborated fully, I wonder if you might talk very briefly together um, about some of the ways in which we might take notice of change, because I think change happens oftentimes subtly, sometimes it happens really drastically, but things can be different and we can just realize that change has occurred. So I'm wondering in both of your practices, how do you attend to, or how do you give your attention to small moments of change or small gestures of change? Is that a fair question? And that's coming, that's my interpretation of the question that an audience member has posted. And in my opinion is, I mean, in Tibetan traditionally, if my family is a diocese, my maybe, you know, grandpapa, mama, or ancestors diocese, nobody keep dead people's picture in their house. That doesn't mean they don't like their person. It means is it 
we have to move on continually, looking forward rather than stuck to something cannot be undue to. These things often we do this, people are, we are caught up with it. Something undoable, then we stuck with the try to make it doable, which is pointless, illogical manners. Something changeable, you don't need to be worried about it. The changing is natural. The philosophy is the behind. Logic never going to let you down. Making thinking you deeper, much more beneficial for yourself, the understood. Everything matters, fact, reasons, logic. That makes much more tangible or lasting things you can live with it the rest of your life without being, you struggle with the day in and day out, things constantly changes. Okay, thank you, Susie, you understand anything? Um, yeah, I feel like uh, when I think about the certain kinds of changes and the reactions that I've had in my life, I feel like, uh, you know, one of the biggest things that happened in the pandemic was the immediate change of like all the support that you kind of rely on as a parent, especially a parent of a young child and all of those being kind of very, very quickly stripped away. And then as an artist being suddenly not being able to connect with people. So whether I was doing any kind of live performance things or working on another series of video portraits, um, suddenly you couldn't meet people face to face. Um, and you couldn't go into the playgrounds and everything. And so this change of losing things, like you said, uh, Geshe, with um, someone dying, like when you have things taken away, I, I don't like that change. I mean, I'll be, I'll be totally honest, right? When you add things that are added to me, right? So it's like, you know, um, something that life has given you, uh, then that change feels uh, a lot more uh, pleasant overall. But uh you know i think one of the things that i've been you know trying to practice more um, to flip in my own mind is this idea that um sometimes when things are taken away uh there is a certain kind of clarity that you have about what's actually there and in, in, in front of you and in fact um oftentimes in an artist practice uh the best thing for me to do and a lot of artists i think would resonate with this um and perhaps all the teachers out there too is actually you really in order to get to the heart of something, um, the heart of a project, um, you need to have a certain kind of clarity. And projects that don't have that clarity, they feel kind of fussy, right? And they feel like there's just too much going on and they're sort of not like, the story is not very clear. Um, and so by stripping away kind of all the things that you might've added that you thought were kind of all these bells and whistles and really being, just sitting with what the idea is, I think is, um, is really freeing and it allows you then to move on to make a really good decision about what to do next. Um, so if, for example, I think one of them was, uh, you know, I'm now solo parenting in Taiwan um, and not having a partner, um, which is sort of the typical narrative when you raise kids, um, was, you know, deeply unsettling and it felt really stressful. Um, but I looked at my then two-year-old and I said, I have to know you in a way that I don't think I would have otherwise have to know you because I could always maybe outsource or put someone else in that position, but it's just going to be you and me, kid. So, um, so I have to be able to confront my ability to be able to interact with you in a way that is really just the two of us. Um, but by doing so, um, I have to say there's like a real secret delight of being able to parent her um, together and sort of be like, this is my little partner in life, right? Like this is someone that we're going on this journey together. Um, and so uh, she continually reminds me that, you know, there's a lot of things with dealing with kids that people are like, you need these 6 million things and you need to take all this advice and you need to do all these blah, right? And it's really, really noisy. Um, and, uh, you know, I have really wise, good friends who will keep reminding me that you just, you know, you really just need to love your kids, right? And how you express that 
um, matters more to them than all these other things going on. Um, and even with the teachers that my, you know, and the other adults in my kid's life right now, um, you know, the one thing I keep saying is, you know, if, if they have a loving presence around her, almost anything else is possible, right? Like she can learn through that. Um, she can uh, change and she can confront fears. And uh, I think maybe that resonates with everyone, right? Is that you just want to feel like you have a loving presence with someone else. Um, and so I feel like that ability to sort of switch between um, change that's a negative, meaning that things are being subtracted out of your life. Um, trying to think of those as opportunities to see life more clearly, to see, to make decisions with a, with less complications um, is one way to embrace that kind of change and welcome it. Um, also getting older, I think helps, right? Because then you're like, oh, <laughs> I've been here before. <laughs> um, and so then you, uh, you know, maybe can uh, get through the suffering part, Geshe, as you, you know, talk about um, a little bit faster um, and maybe with less, uh, less, less internal damage. Okay, Susie, let's we really move on next subject. Okay. And so just before we that lead to understanding next subject called um, interdependent origination. And let me go into interdependent origination. Then I'm talk about it. That lead to a similarity too. And everything what we've been associated with the day in and day out, everything is literally dependent on each other. But at the gross level and the subtle level. Gross level, such like puzzle, and subtle level, my we cannot see, you cannot touch it, but scientifically prove everything secondarily changing manners. So same as going back to, we talk about the concept of impermanence. And so if you see that kind of interdependent origination, we had a coexistence, but dependent on each other's matters how we survive since birth to under die. As a human being, we are a social creature. We totally depend on some other people, particularly you're surrounded by your wonderful children, nieces and nephews, or you are a wonderful faculty, teach young kids, or you are a family, you know, family holder, they have surrounding a lot of students or a lot of, you know, young ages surround you. Everything what you do is going to affect on surrounding phenomena. As teachers, as artists, everything we can learn from each other. This picture, good example, a Tibetan call or a harmonies, or a harmony, or for friendly or for harmonies. All of these elephant to bird, elephant is the youngest one, bird is oldest one. The significance of teach young generations, respecting elderlies. In other hand, Elephant to bird, everything depend on the matters and lifestyle, such like next to a giant tree, elephant fertilize, bird spread seeds around, monkeys bring food that you cannot reach by elephant, rabbits making holes next to a tree that give you fertilizer go into the root of the tree, we depend on each other. These things Tibetans teach young generations, we are totally dependent on each other. Everything what we learn, particularly young generations, the kids, they can learn a lot of things, what we said, or our behaviors, everything surrounding can pick them up. 
So interdependent origination also can lead to next concept. Like I say, gross level to subtle level. Also, dependent origination means depend on the cause or condition. Cause depends by a result. Result depends depends by a cause. Nothing exists without a cause or condition. Cause defines the result. Result defines the result depend defines the cause. Everything what we do in and out, daily our life, palm of our hand, everything is totally depend on the surrounding phenomena. Wonderful, you make a big smiling, gonna make it happy for someone else. Your mood swing is not gonna harm to you, also harming other people. Everything what we behave as a negative, except hurting yourself. You're lying, you're insulting, it's going to hurt yourself more than harming other people. Anger can harm other, anger can harm yourself more than other people. So these things that we understand, everything is dependent on a cause or condition, the known as interdependent origination, also dependent origination, depend on each other. Anything, everything you know. This is a physical level, a psychological level. Anger, hatred, jealousy, these things cannot rise without a cause or condition. If you eliminate, if we eliminate the source of the anger, they ultimately eliminate anger itself because the cause defines the result. Result defines the cause. So go on and on, we can talk about these things in a month, a year, just kinds of understanding interdependent origination. This interdependent origination, time and knowledge, this has been introduced by Tibetans, by Indian master, called Nagarjuna, Nagarjuna. So it's very depth level of concept, essence of the you know, philosophy of the Buddhism, you know, also understood as, in, you know, is essence of the all phenomena. If we recognize it that way, you can see everything is dependent on each other. You begin to gain some respect for others, also generating, help you cultivating love and compassion toward the surrounding people. Anything, Susie, would you like to add to? Uh, thank you, uh, Gacy. So, um, you know, I think rooting this back to um, the video portraits, I feel like that was, you know, when people sort of ask me, like, how do you make the video portraits? Um, <laughs> Like they were almost stupidly simple, I would say. I would, you know, the actual moment is you push record on a camera and then you just let it keep running, right? It's unedited, there's nothing going, you just, you just, you just, you just be. Um, but, uh, you know, I think that that was, you know, sort of this off the cuff, sort of, you know, uh, backhanded, you know, kind of, you, you know, waving the hand kind of way of describing it. But really, um, the integrity of the work is actually all the work that happens before, right? Being able to connect with someone and understanding that you are connected with another person, um, even if you feel like your lives are completely disparate. And so obviously, uh, me in Seattle at the time, um, you know, as an artist and, um, and someone who was working in the oil fields or like their whole family was working in the oil fields all their life had very, very different lives. And here we were connecting um, in this moment. Um, I really felt it was important though when we were actually recording that uh, there was no distraction. And so it was, you know, that we would, you know, even maybe the closest thing is it's like, it was sort of a meditation. Um, there were no phones. We tried to sort of like create this little bubble around us, no matter what, what kind of chaos was happening around us so that we could actually just sit across from each other and just um, just be present, really, really present. Um, 
And uh, I think that that was really important. And in fact, it was at Crystal Bridges that one of the audience members when I did a presentation said, I think what you're actually doing is shaping the energy between two people, that you and the other person, um, there's a sort of sculptural energy that happens in between. And that's what we actually feel in the portrait. Um, and uh, I feel like good teachers do that, right? The moment that they walk into a room, they know how to shape that energy in a room and connect with their students in a way, you can't teach that in, you know, in, a, you know, in education programs. Um, and I think one of the things that's really important to acknowledge here is that this is oftentimes a very uh, like feminine quality, right? If you're gonna assign sort of genders, um, it's a powerful thing, right, to be able to have this empathy and connection, um, but it's oftentimes not as well compensated and it's not as well recognized in the world as being important. Um, but of course, this is what matters, right? This is why people don't want to just be on Zoom all the time for the rest of their life, that they actually want to be present in the energy of, um, you know, another amazing human being. Um, but do you feel like, uh, Geishi, that you can have connections digitally like this? And you know, what is kind of preserved in these kind of interactions? And then what do you feel like is lost? I mean, it's, like I said before, you have to have some degrees of tangible manners, otherwise, such like mindful meditations becoming shallow, shallow, shallow. So similarly as, as, the, as Susie, you providing a lot of art, you know, sound, these things are demonstrate, understanding everything's coexistence, dependent on each other. Good example like a sound. Sound is the best example of impermanence. Sounds like you taking video. Video is literally is a small piece of picture. It's not like one link thing. We think that way. Similarly, but the sound is constantly changes that don't have a continuum existence. One sound go to the from beginning to the end. So these things are we can learn from our surrounding phenomena, things individual to create and art, craft. Even you're doing a garden work, you know their cause and condition manners. You know their impermanent manners. You know their dependent manners, which is that going to lead to next subject called enthusiasm is a huge part of your driven force. By joyfully, personally your goal and without yourself put into depression or drop off everything while you do, walked away. I've seen that all the time. Literally I saw people can throw away their diploma in the trash. That going to happen. And people without enthusiasm, without understanding impermanence, without understanding dependent origination, we difficult to accept, you know, changing the cut your life as a matter of the changings happen to you. You feel like you are not deserved to be this way, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not gonna go a lot of detail level. So there are many ways to you can explain that through the form of art and craft and everything what you're saying so in the day and in the day out. What else yeah. do you want to Oh, uh, I think there was a question. Um, there's actually a question from an audience member, and maybe this actually connects back a little bit to what you were talking about, Geishi, before. Um, so someone asked um, about the portrait series. Are they sitting in front of you or the camera or both? And do you stare at the subjects the whole time before it loops? Um, so I am sitting in front of them with the camera. So it's kind of both of us together. Um, and uh, I think that the the, the thing that I would say is different is that I, I don't think I'm staring. So I think that 
um, I think you stare at somebody or you stare at something when in fact you don't have a connection that you're sort of like, what is this thing, right? Or, um, and this is why you tell kids like, don't stare at, you know, someone, da, 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 da. Um, now, well, we can go back to that topic here, but I think that, um, you know, I think that sometimes, for example, like if I have a friend or a family member who is in a really tough situation, and oftentimes your first response is, what can I do or what can I say, right? And, you know, what they would love to just be able to sort of voice at that moment is that they just kind of want to want you to be with them and to really understand where they are, right? That's the kind of the beginning and starting point. And I feel like when I'm sitting with somebody um, that we've already, you know, wandered, you know, like played pool with, you know, and uh, stayed in the man camps together and ate dinner and exchanged stories, um, you know, there's this kind of natural flow of interaction. And then suddenly, you know, you're asked to be present with somebody and not speak. Um, and the energy is, it's, it's constantly changing, right? And so, I, you know, sometimes, yeah, we, you know, I don't, I don't just like watch them and just, you know, like this uh, <laughs> in a microscope, but you're just trying to feel like where the other person at is and, and trying to meet them there. Um, so I feel like the, the eyes are less important than sort of like what, what is coming from everything mm -hmm. around me. Um, the portrait of Johnny, um, he's kind of, he was definitely a funny one because, uh, you know, he's like super brawny and super macho and everything. And then there's this like little, you know, <laughs> there's like little Asian woman on, on the other side. Um, and it was, it was a little confrontational at first, right? He was kind of like, all right, we're going to, we're going to do this thing and I'm going to be competitive and whatever. Um, and there was this constant back and forth where I was like, I'm not competing with you. I'm not, I'm not going to win. Um, and I feel like this exchange was happening throughout that entire time. Mm -hmm. um, and you can kind of see that as you, if you sit throughout the entire, um, you know, whatever, 20 or 30 minutes, um, his, the, the, the flicker and the energy in his eye actually changes, right? So sometimes he's actually very confrontational. Sometimes he's like totally trying to hold back a laugh, you know, um, and it's all there. And another person who, I, no matter who it is, who's sitting across from that um, portrait, mm -hmm. they can register those changes. And I feel like that's a really amazing thing that humans can do and, um, and, and kids can do too. So, um, so yeah, I feel like that's the kind of uh, interdependent connection that um, means that it's less staring and more um, just really trying to be and match where that person is at that time. Um, and uh, and those, those changes are definitely within those portraits. And I'm looking at one of these questions, someone has a answer about, about anger sometimes let me explain that a little bit from that. I'm, I was talking about interdependent origination impermanence. You have to remember, let me, let me start all about it again. Tibetan says- oh, wait, can, can you actually share what the question is so that, can everyone see it? I'm not sure, can everyone see yeah, the question? The question is, they said, don't, don't we sometimes need to be angry that's a question. Mm -hmm. And in, as a myself, I grew up within the academic environment. We've been taught to whether you are a pleasure or displeasure, neither way, you need to be, be patient. That's things, my background, these things taught me as a childhood to under this level. Of course, anger is difficult to overcome, but however, you have to remember, anger, hatred, jealousy, any kind of mental intoxication, these things appear as our mind as protections, mochers, self-defensives. Yes, some point my we need to be appear as anger, but constantly you remind yourself without 
controlling your emotion, internal manners of the, your thought patterns, is to we trap into matters of the known as toxications. Reach up to toxication, the unable to undo during that minute. There are no other you, room to, huh? Oh no, sorry, Geshe. I think you actually mentioned something that I think is really important then with the topic of anger is you said you were trained with this idea of patience, right? That patience is really important in your practice. And maybe um, when you say, do you sometimes have to be angry and whether there are circumstances when anger is the decent response, there is this idea of a patient anger, which spans a certain amount of time, which is actually a positive action, right? That, um, that when maybe you're talking about this sort of like explosive reactionary anger, that kind of anger can really just harm uh, yourself individually. But is there, is there a kind of a, is there in any kind of Buddhist tradition, some idea of a patient anger that, um, that can lead to some sort of change that is important to have in the world? Like I said, you know, may appear as physically as angry, but internal manners, you need to be, be mindfully, not get into, you know, matters of the intoxication. Mm. Means you can really become angry, like you're drunk. You reach up to become drunk, you cannot undo anything. So similarly to intoxication means that you intoxicate. Psychologically, you intoxicate. Sometimes intoxication gonna give you muchness of the feeling but this is a short period of time. They will leave your imprint, harm you, they're much longer than manager you gain out of it. And they're gonna harm you more than a manager you gain out of it. Those the reason, as my background as a Buddhist tradition, and particularly Nalanda University tradition, we taught that way. Chinese occupied Tibet since 1959. I remember myself and my ancestors, my uncles, those been executed, killed. Being angry cannot undo anything for me. 1.2 million Tibetan people die. I cannot undo those kind of people. Nor that I become angry toward, you know, whatever, you know, the circumstances to a Chinese policy, no good to solve no problem either. But we have to move on, to move forward to prevent problem before rising. Ultimately, right. that will give you lasting happiness. Then, pleasure you gain out from short sighted mind and a drugs, synthetic powders to the angers to attachment. So therefore, we choose as a long-term beneficial rather than a short-term. So I think what's, what's incredibly interesting as I'm looking at these questions coming in based on what both of you are talking about and some of the connections that you're making between your work um, in, in different spaces is I think there's a great curiosity about how we recognize and work with our emotions, right? And I'm thinking maybe I've just seen a question, Susie, that's directed to the Fracking Fields Project and to Johnny in particular. What can art teach us about recognizing emotions, working with emotions, um, engaging with emotions? And in a way, um, Geshe, you've, or, um, Geshe, you've spoken about maybe ways of recognizing, making sense of, working with emotions, not reacting immediately and so forth. But the question I'm seeing is, what can art teach us about emotions? That's a good uh, That's a that's good a, question. That's a really good question. And remember, positive and negative thought never rise simultaneously together. You don't want anything, say, no, 
and uh, metals reflection or negative thought patterns, you learn to prevent to not to become. Like I said before, kinds of understanding impermanence, patience tolerance, this can, this can lead you lasting happiness rather than you become agitated, angry, sadness, things happen to you, dislike a displeasure can provoke you things, act, certain things you want, you don't like it yourself, they will impend you something long-term. You have to live with it. Which is nobody wants to go that path. I truly believe. Yeah, I feel also that, um, that uh, art as a category formalizes, I think, things, emotions that may be kind of, you know, all over the, the area. And then art allows, and by art, I don't just mean visual art, I mean, you know, writing and anything that's in pop culture, uh, you know, movies, right? All of these things have a way of being able to take what I think are hard to, for many people to express themselves. Um, and, you know, I think everyone has this, right, where it's like one of the most important things of why uh, diversity of opinion and uh, diversity of perspectives is important is because there is someone out there who has the ability to harness some kind of emotion that's out there and really hard to describe and you distill it in a way so that someone else can actually look at that and say, yes, that is exactly the way that I feel about that, or that is exactly the way that I would have written it if I had the words to be able to do it. And so it's almost like this little release that you have that you feel like you're actually seen in the world um, and potentially understood. Um, and so I think that Geshe, as you're talking about, you know, uh, having this connection with someone and being able to, uh, you know, have patience and tolerance, it's like, you know, you also, have you know have this deep empathy with somebody right and so the more that individuals can cultivate this idea of imagining themselves what it's like to be another person and what it's like to have this other kind of experience and um and then be able to distill it in a way that is compassionate and uh, compelling i think then is um is, is is what arts function is and so for example even with the fracking fields that was part of what my motivation was is to say whatever black and white political ideals you may have about fracking i want to show you individuals that will maybe potentially muddy and complexify that kind of experience because you may know someone like this um, and if you have a little bit of um, a little more empathy after you sat with this person um, maybe it makes the way you make decision making um, less angry and less um, and less impulsive in a way that um, still can I think create change in movement, right? Like if you are fundamentally opposed to fracking, I think there are strategies and ways that you can think about how to uh, negate that, but you also understand that there are individuals on the other side um, who are deeply affected by, by all those actions, right? They're all connected. Um, and then there's other questions about uh, what's your experience with sitting with someone? And I think Yeshi, this would also be a really good question for you. So what is your experience with sitting with someone who's not in your physical presence, um, who you can't hear or see? So Yeshi, have you been asked to be with someone, um, like be present with someone, even though you're actually not physically with them or maybe even on a, on a Zoom call? Yeah, that's the possible, that's a possible. You have to be very open-mindedly, you know, particularly as Buddhist point of view, as a compassionate point of view, you cannot reject or cannot deny it or cannot be ignore every surrounding phenomenon. We have to be, even someone not around you, the way to you can interpret it or what you can, they can participate with you with your physically, energy, psychologically, you think that way. That's the huge part of Buddhist tradition. You do a lot of visualizations. You visualize in front of you, enemy, strangers, your loved one. You think about alternately meditating. Why this call enemy? Why this I call my friend? Why this I call stranger? Because of the due to my 
concept idea, it, these three people appear to me categorically. Fundamentally, they don't have their concept and biologically, psychologically, don't have that identity born with it, known as he is my enemy, he is my stranger, he is my love. The appearance categorically depends on my thought patterns. So similarly to I can change it, I can change, I can transform surrounding my phenomena, whether I see or not see, whether they live in distant or not distant, neither way, I can change their feelings, their emotion, out from my own concepts and idea, sending energy out, sending energy in. The way that you can do these things are a lot of things. Typical Buddhist traditionally, healing masters are very commonly we do their practice for long distance healing, short distance healing, those things we do. I think that lead to next one is someone asking about the enthusiasm. You know, let me go with that. Just before we move to enthusiasm, Geshe, there is one outstanding question that I'd like for us to address. And I guess that's the question of coexistence. And this section has been about our interdependence, our entanglement with the world and with others, and our coexistence. And in some respects, I think it leads to Susie's practice, where Susie, you have mentioned the words like distilling and stripping away, right? And the, the fracking feed project has generated a lot of interest in, in the questions and responses tonight. And one of the questions I think that's coming up is um, that stripping away is an act of noticing and acknowledging relationships and the coexistence of many things, but yet stripping away is making a decision about what is more important at a particular time or what, um, can be somewhat downplayed and what needs to be amplified. So the, the video portraits are silent works, right? The, there is no sound, but there is there, but you've captured a period of time, like 30 minutes of somebody sitting opposite. And um, can you talk a little bit about um, decision making, about stripping away and about um, 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 the act of um, making a decision about which relations you want to amplify and which relations you want you may wish to downplay or are are downplayed as a result of the decisions that you make. Does that make sense? Uh, I, I think so. Um, also, want to acknowledge the bird as back yes. here. I'm tweeting right now. <laughs> I feel like every time I talk or anyone else talks, it needs to join in the conversation. So um, <laughs> uh, that is the bird. Um, uh, we're going to ignore it as much as we can here. <laughs> uh, so yeah, in terms of, uh, I, I think what it is, is, you know, you, people have a capacity for how much they can actually handle. And uh, like, you know, data scientists like to talk about how many connections can we actually have that are meaningful? I would probably challenge that Geshe and many other uh, practicing uh, Buddhists would actually argue that the number of connections that you can have that are meaningful are much higher, as long as you can really be fully present with it. Um, I, I think that there's a way that people can, you, you know you can find some chemistry right with somebody, right? That you know that there's a way that you, even if you have very, very disparate lives, that there's something else that you can connect with. And on that level, you kind of try to amplify that. So, um, you know, I feel like one of the great privileges I have in my life is that when I think about the array of friends that I have, they're actually very, very not like me, right? They're a different stage in life. They're either 20 years old or they're almost 80. Um, they have very different upbringings than me. They have very different um, ways of looking at the world. Um, I think one of the great things about talking to Geshe is that I don't know very much about um, Buddhism. I have a really good friend who is a Buddhist nun, but she's, um, you know, she's, she, you know, I, we don't, she doesn't have to teach me. She's just kind of is. And so it's been really great to be able to amplify what I understand from her with Geshe. Um, but uh, yeah, I think you start right with that idea that there's some sort of seed of a connection and it may be completely unexpected as to where that is. And that's what you amplify and nourish and grow. 
Um, and, uh, and part of the reason why I felt like the video portraits needed to be silent was that oftentimes talking, and especially when you're talking to someone that you don't know, it's actually a front for trying to present a certain kind of image um, that uh, is something that you would want to present, or maybe because you're nervous, that's what you do. And when you take that away and just are with the person, um, you see a very different kind of person and a different kind of vulnerability. And one of the most powerful things that actually happens during the recording is the first few minutes, and I think Geisha, you could probably understand this too when you're with somebody is, you know, the first few minutes is really noisy, right? There's a lot of like the energy is kind of high. Everyone's like, I don't know what to do. I'm a little bit confused, right? Um, and even if I say, ah, oh, you know, the camera's just gonna start rolling and we're just gonna sit and we're just going to, to, to be, um, they don't really know what that is. Um, and so everyone's a little bit tense. And then even, so me as an artist, I kind of think, oh, I don't think this one's gonna work. I think there's just not gonna be the right kind of energy. Um, but almost always people don't really have the endurance to be able to keep up this front over and over again, right? They can do a photograph on Instagram, but they can't really keep doing it over and over again. And so as the minutes pass, suddenly the energy in the room just kind of settles. And, and then suddenly you're just like, it's working, right? That there's some kind of, now the energy is like, this is, this is kind of what this person is. In fact, if you didn't have a camera around, that if you didn't have people that were kind of like trying to ask them to be a certain way. Um, and that person is, I think, hopefully what um, is revealed in those portraits. That's that's really good, Susie. And uh, I have uh, some of my friends, they are a uh, Tanga artist, draw Tanga image, you know. And I ask him why you draw that images of the Buddha depending on other, other, you know, tradition that we do. He said, that's how I like it. Then I said, you know, have you ever thought things what you draw as Tanga picture, or someone buys from you, someone take it home, they look at their image, and echinus of what you draw are going to imprint someone as a thoughts of mine coming deeds. So now that someone's enjoying and uh, someone learning from misunderstood from your tanga, not only for they learn unequally, but also at the same time, you create a negative karma simultaneously. Because you, one who is responsible, make some things right. It's not about just for making money. It's about accurate, proper, respectable. These things are required. Doesn't matter what you do. Unless you're doing contemporary art. Don't have a lot of trace of the understanding background, but that's different. So they are each single of us. Doesn't matter whether you are a teacher, or you are an artist, you're making us and crafts, or you're just for a gardener. Everything what you do has consequences. So I hate to um, I hate to interrupt the flow of thought, Geshe, but part of my responsibility tonight is to keep people on time. So um, if if it's if it's okay with you, maybe we can move into the third segment or the third section. And I'm going to pass it back to you, Geshe, to introduce the concept of enthusiasm, and and then we will we will fall into conversation after you've had um, uh, some time to to share some opening remarks. So that's good. Um, my apologies for interrupting. No, 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 no. That's good. That's good thing. We need to do that. A lot of talk about a third concept is called known as enthusiasm. Enthusiasm is very important. It's not just for habits. Enthusiasm, you know, enthusiasm is a heroic, encouraging perseverance. We become like warriors 
that it pays in internal, external battles in our cause or benefit for others. I took those photos, I invited those monks doing the Sen Mandala. Not only people inspired what they do want for art, but they have this enthusiasm. Enthusiasm, they are joyfully in pursuing in every circumstances. That's really important. I remember one day we're making mandala on the corner of the room. Overnight, some mouses got into the mandala, screw up everything, destroy all art. All, all, none of monks upset. They say, that's okay, we can do again. That's not a big deal. Average people, they will get upset, angry and mad, you know, screaming. So enthusiasm is very important. Enthusiasm gonna frequently reflect or open the benefit of perseverance. Follows of discouragement, because without developing perseverance, we can become easily dissolutions. In other words, uh, enthusiasm is opposite of what we know as lazy. We know as a lazy. Lazy means lazy or the postponing or procrastinating. Lazy that not pursuing what you're supposed to do or you you are you are stuck with the meaningless things or you engaging rather than you're doing for yourself. So also lazy can be you know overcome within the discouragement. So enthusiasm is very important for a daily our lifetime, or you can say joyous perseverance. Joyous means joyfully pursue your goal aim. It's gonna help you clear away sufferings, darkness, which is based on the freedom from any difficulties. Each single we have to have that kind of enthusiasm. Without that enthusiasm, it's difficult to reach our aims, goals too. So if we have enthusiasm, we regard a failure as a symbol in another step to try to succeed or inspiration for ourselves and others. Like I said before, with the joy for perseverance, you cover with it. In the circumstances you have an experience as unsuccessful, some unsuccessful manners in your daily your life. As a good example, like this monk's incredible job making Sara Mandala, at the end of their destroy, or maybe, you know, we take down to the rivers to, you know, sharing energy to the rest of the world. If we have enthusiasm, we can transform adverse situation into opportunity for spiritual growth. Transformation, transformation. Uh, this picture I took in my garden, then now is the last season to have uh, this kind of picture right now here. A transformation, transform adverse situation into opportunity of spiritual growth. You might go to having problems or difficulties. Someone criticizes you verbally, physically, or insult you. It is an opportunity to us to gain something good things out of it. Think realistically possible. Sometimes difficult to do. We have a driven by our ego. Doesn't matter how we weak are, still we think I'm better than any other people. Not as a conscious level, it's subconscious we have that kind of mind. Enthusiasm is very important. Perseverance, joyfully pursue your goal and they lead you becoming rejoicing your good deeds. 
benefit, not just for the benefit of yourself, benefit for others. As I grow this flower in my flower yard, nearby road, how many people go in and out, they enjoy it? For the result of the, someone's efforts. Without intent, with the person brains can pursue anything what you do will be benefit for others and benefit for yourself. So enthusiasm is a huge part of a Buddhist tradition. Without that, you cannot accomplish anything up to enlightened to mundane level, happiness or success. You have to have an enthusiasm can overcome any matters of the, you know, a problem day in and day out. Let's, okay. let me go, Suzy, can you add something? Yeah, so Geshe, I think that that was one of the most, uh, you know, I think uh, it's not something that I think when people like, you know, lay people think about what is, uh, you know, when you think of Buddhist traditions and you're like, here are these solemn monks, you know, and they're doing their things and they're implacable and they're not stressed out. And then if you think enthusiasm is actually the thing that you really need to uh, to make change happen, I think that that's, uh, it's been a really a great thing and a good reminder for a lot of people. So um, I just want to quickly share my screen. So um, this is uh, this is Hana, my uh, my four year old, um, and I feel like uh, you know she embraces this idea of enthusiasm. And when I think about enthusiasm, um, I think about it as kind of this light or energy. Uh, that as an adult in her life, you want to ensure that it doesn't go out because you can tell, right, um, when, uh, when someone loses that spark um, and that sense of enthusiasm in what they do and how they approach life. Um, and so, you know, having that innate sort of childlike sense of curiosity and openness about the world and what, uh, what could be, um, Oh, my hair is so short there. <laughs> um, that uh, I, uh, you know, I find I find it to be a real blessing to have a child um, in the middle of my life right now. Um, you know, I'm approaching fifty, and uh, uh, she's, you know, kind of really compelled me to be. Um, more open-minded, more malleable, and frankly, just more enthusiastic about things. Sometimes even if I don't want to at first be enthusiastic, um, I know that to be present with her, there has to be a certain kind of enthusiasm that matches hers as well. Um, so, and I, I feel definitely that that is something that I think a lot of the teachers in this audience would also really resonate with, right? That, um, you know, it doesn't matter how much knowledge is embodied in um, you know, any person's individual mind if they don't deliver it with a certain kind of joyous passion um, and excitement. You know, you might as, it's better if you read it you know, in a book yourself and have kind of your own sort of internal enthusiasm. But when you do have an inspiring teacher who can deliver the message in a way that, you know, just like, you know, fires you up, then, um, you know, that's just a really great gift. So, um, so yeah, and I, I feel like as an artist, it's one of the things that's really important to actually also persevere with art because um, many artists work kind of, you know, anonymously. Um, they don't get a lot of acknowledgement and public recognition. So what allows them to continue to be an artist is actually what is it about the practice? What is it about what they do? The drawings, the, you know, the performances, whatever they make that actually feeds them and gives them a certain kind of joy. Um, and uh, I do feel like that when I sort of changed from one kind of career path and became an artist, I realized that no one was really going to say, ah, Susie, here's your diploma. This is your uniform for being an artist, right? That it was, um, that all I, all I could do was wake up each morning and say, today I am still an artist um, and I will do the things uh, to pursue that. Um, and uh, just one day after another, that kind of accrues and, um, 
And then you sort of internalize that as being like, yeah, that's, 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 that's who I am. Um, it's a changing definition um, that has now also allowed me to feel like being in the startup world and entrepreneurial space um, is still a part of my kind of artist practice. Um, and I feel that I approach it in a way that is different than other technologists. And it is as an artist and it is someone that tries to be empathetic to other people, um, which is actually very counterintuitive to the technology world. Um, but uh, it's something that I think is um, an important uh, presence to have within that space. That's she's really wonderful. In other words, I love to express enthusiasm is joyfully pursuing your goal. Whether you are artist, whether you are a teacher, whether you are you know coaching or maybe you know what you call an uh, advisor, every single your action is going to affect on someone else's life. You draw image as your artist. Your thought patterns, your motivations, your compassion or loving, everything is impacts on whoever they looking that image. But these are hidden energy that you don't feel it, you don't see that way. But the reality is that's going to make a difference in life, you, life of others. I'm telling undergraduate students, if you manage to hold the door, guy who coming behind you won't take you more than half of a second. Without the slamming door to the person who coming behind you. Without expecting you have someone who say thank you or not thank you. Are you doing your job? That's all that matters. Do your own job without any expectations attached. That intent, that motivation is driven by enthusiasm, effects on each other as interdependent origination, everything secondarily changes. Nothing same as one second, one minute, as we wish to, something held down to forever. That's not going to happen. That's all about this kind of concept. We discuss about impermanence, interdependent origination, and enthusiasm. It's a part of our life. You don't have, have to be a Buddhist monk. You don't have to be a believer. You don't have to be a Buddhist, period. You don't have to be. You don't have to believe anything. Living with a re re realistic your life with that intent, that motivation, everything what you do is not going to not only make a difference in your life, life of others. I truly believe that myself. So how do you feel, uh, what could people do in the audience today uh, to maybe foster a more, enthousi more enthusiasm in what they do um, if they feel that it's flagging in their life or lacking a little bit. Uh, what are the kind of uh, thoughts or exercises or patterns that people can do to start to regenerate that more um, if they're feeling depleted in that realm? In other words, uh, let me go back to Suji. Yeah, I can start there too. And enthusiasm is joyfully pursuing your goal. Enthusiasm, you, let me say you have a job of the waiter, serve in restaurants. You are engaging matters of your daily life. You are very joyfully pursuing you, doing your job with the compassion, loving respect for others. Not only for adding whoever clients come to eat, enjoying your, your presence on it, you will gain more tips. You will get more respectful. You will can learn tremendous from your behavior rather than you become more swing every day. These things are part of our life. We have to learn to do. 
within humanity, within ourselves. We share other people's around you. Don't stuck with just something enemies. Anger, hatred, rageness. Won't do any good. Like I said, anything what you do day in and day out, think very carefully. Are you enjoying or not enjoying your job? You're not enjoying, that will lead you more stress and anxiety, depression. Then you've been enjoying and whatever, whatever you do, day in, day out. And you need to seek in those kind of job. Something inspire you or inspire other people. Something looking back to months and years after you, I was tremendously enjoy it. Something carries on the rest of your life that grows into your thoughts, your mind, your life as a maturely impact on you. Remember how minute level every single action is counts. Doesn't matter how small it is. We have to remember with respect, treat everybody just like someone treat you. Treat everybody just like you, loving person you've ever known. They will help you restrain your thoughts, mind of the loving, compassion, respect. Also, you gain tremendous and positive deeds. With your daily your life, you don't have to be sat down, close the eye to meditate. That's your meditation, day in and day out. Something you can look, in, look forward to do continually, it inspire you, inspire other people to do so. Okay, so is there anything? Thank you. I feel like that's a really good reminder. Um, and it's something that I think is achievable, but just finding even something really small that you can look forward to allows you to kind of build that idea of a um, more enthusiastic practice in life. And you can feel it, right? It, it is definitely like the waiter uh, who has that kind of energy and attitude. You just love like <laughs> being around that person. Um, and I remember a friend telling me that uh, she had heard that the opposite of exhaustion is not just uh, rest, um, but it's actually meaning in life. Um, and I think that one of the things that trips up a lot of people, um, artists included, is that you think, oh, what I'm doing is meaningless or that uh, what I um, that what you know that what I contribute to the world doesn't have a lot of importance. Um, and I felt this also with the individuals who are fracking and maybe um, people in the classroom also talk about uh, maybe kids who actually feel that way. But I think that you're reminding us that every small action um, affects other people. And so therefore everything that we do does have meaning. Um, and that, you know, even if you feel like you're sitting in an office or you're doing something that doesn't feel like um, it's, it has a lot of like this grand meaning, um, that if you do your small job well, that you make someone's life easier um, and therefore a little bit better. And, uh, and so that that does have meaning. So, um, so thank you for that. I feel like that's a really uh, a good takeaway. Anything guys? So I guess we have about, we probably have about 12 minutes left in the conversation. And I suppose as the moderator, I've been listening very carefully and jotting down some notes. And I've just made a list of some of the, um, maybe some of the gifts that you, both of you have shared with us this evening. And I'm just gonna read them and then I'm gonna invite you to add to them or maybe to elaborate on them if you feel um, that would be, would be helpful. So listening to the conversation and, and paying attention to what is emerging in the back and forth, I felt that some of the things that we were being encouraged to do are as follows. So embrace the unexpected, be comfortable with the unknown, work with what is given, find new and different uses for what is already available, work with our emotions, rejoice in our good deeds, joyfully pursue our goals, follow ideas and practices where they lead us. And I think finally, Geshe, something that you've said, encounter 
everyone we meet with love, right? So I felt that as the conversation unfolded, there was, for me at least, these were some of the gifts that you shared with us intentionally or otherwise. Um, given that we have a little bit more, a few more minutes left, I want to um, invite you perhaps to either respond or to add or to um, maybe circle back to something that you might have said previously that you'd like to elaborate a little bit more on if that if that's um, if that's okay. Thank you, Don. I would say maybe conclusion will be doesn't matter pleasure or displeasure neither way. Doesn't matter pleasure or displeasure neither way. We need to be, be patient, being tolerant. Don't lose your temples. Joyfully pursue your goal. That's all I'm going to say. Our conclusion is, you know, in Chawani, at the beginning, at the end, two things are very important. At the beginning, we have motivation. At the end, enjoying your good deeds that inspire you continually to do so, also inspires other people. That's all I'm going to add. Thank you. Um, I think that uh, I think that there's something that, you know, to, to some degree, one of the things that I think I've had uh, the great privilege of being able to do is to say that now I have these identities, identities as being an artist, an entrepreneur, and then a parent and um, and that uh, sort of the typical wisdom is to say that you should have these hard boundaries in between and sort of a separation. But um, I think that the kind of themes that we talked about today, um, what's actually been really nice is to feel like one thing that I understand or learn from in one realm is actually applied to another. And so there's a lot of actually crossover and spillover um, that the boundaries are very messy and, uh, and I, I prefer it that way. Um, and so that if there is some kind of uh, joyful enthusiasm that I have within my, um, you know, art practice, that I can somehow bring that into how I interact with my daughter and uh, feel like there's an artistic way of being able to be a parent. Um, and the same thing goes, you know, one way or the other. And so I, I, you know, I feel like this is, um, I think giving people the permission to actually say that if there's something really joyful that happens here, that you can bring it into another realm. Um, I think that's, uh, that's a, a good thing to have. Um, and that those separations don't, you know, I think they don't always have to be there as much as people uh, are saying that they have to. Um, and uh, yeah, I think also for me, this idea of patience and uh, temperance, got to do a little more of that, Geshe. So that's a, a good reminder for me. Um, <laughs> my daughter will thank you also for that. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I feel like there's this, you know, there's this idea that, you know, everything is like, it's always like, oh, it's calm. But I think I, I also, sort of resonate with this idea you say where it's like on the outside you can have this like you know uh that outside you can have this sort of energy or anger or something that if you need to to sort of affect a certain kind of change you can but inside you still have to have uh, a certain core of calmness um in order to be able to not destroy yourself in that. Um, and I think that's a really good reminder as well. So um, I really appreciate that. And I always feel like it's great in a conversation like this, if I can learn um, and not just feel like I'm just spouting out stuff as well. So, so thank you for that. Um, and I don't know if there's anyone in the audience who has any last minute questions, um, but otherwise, uh, Donald, I'll let One you- One thing today I mentioned my last class lecture. Today is my last lecture in my university class. I was mentioned by class students today one thing. I said, you will learn more someone displeasing you than praising you. You have to be, that's not that easy to learn to think that way. If you 
honestly think someone said you you are overweight. Whether you take lessons, whether you take criticizing, it depends on you, not what they say to you. Something we have to learn the hard way to cope with it. Being realistic is possible. And often people love someone pays you to that in displeasing you. A Tibetan tradition they say, neither someone pays or not praising, neither way, you need to be, be patient. So I learned that way, hard way. I was learning academic system, Manastro University. We debate, challenge reports, depend on in front of a thousand, thousand people, sometimes you're a loser, sometimes you're a winner. At the end of loser going to learn more than the winners. That's all about a lesson. Sometimes not that easy to come lessons to you. You have to learn hard way. You have to be fully, be mindfulness is required. Be mindful, introspection, and cautious. Without being mindful, your mind is not think accurately. It's like, it's like more like a toxicant, or you are in the middle of the night, sleepy, won't do anything good, accurate. You have to be mindful, introspections, fully aware your thought patterns, what you're saying, being aware of what you're talking, come out of your mouth, being aware of what you do every single day, be, be mindful introspection. That's a principle things can shape your mind, your thoughts, your life, transforming yourself out of the something you don't want to be living in it for the rest of your life. That's what I would say, anything? Susie, you want to add? Not, I'm done with it today. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that's great. Thank you. So, uh, so I yes, think sorry. we're moving. Sorry, Susie. Go oh, no, no, I was going to say, Donald, please uh, uh, wrap, take this, take this home. So we're, we're almost out of time, but I want to um, do two things. I'm going to return us to Tiffany in a moment. But before we return to Tiffany, um, I want to take this opportunity to thank you, Susie, and to thank you, um, Geshe, for being so generous in conversation this evening and for allowing the conversation to go where it went. And, to, and I appreciated so much how you followed it and how you, and, and how you traveled. Um, in my opening remarks, I mentioned that there's something special about every conversation that we witness or that we engage in. For you could say that within every conversation, there is always a promise of finding something that we have not yet discovered. So I'm hoping that the audience members tonight um, had that experience, perhaps, of finding something in this conversation that they had not yet discovered, or perhaps of recognizing something that was present and that somehow um, had gone unnoticed previously, or heard our speakers say things in ways that um, that were said for the first time. So on that note, I want to end, and before I pass over to Tiffany, by thanking both of you again, and also thanking our audience members for posting questions, for loving the bird, Susie, and for commenting on how much they appreciated the post-human in this conversation, um, and, for, and for offering other questions as well. So without further ado, I'm gonna pass it over to Tiffany to close us out this evening and just to offer my gratitude for one last time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Donald, Susie, Geishi. What an engaging conversation. Um, thank you so much for your collaboration. And I feel your patience over this process. Um, I am extremely grateful to have had those conversations with both of you and to kind of witness tonight and you know, everything that was spoken and hopefully this recording will be available via YouTube. Um, I also want to encourage those that are wanting PD credit to drop your name and your email address in the chat. 
Um, we will offer that to you in a follow-up um, sometime next week. We also have a survey um, that I will also drop the link in the chat. We'd love to hear your feedback on how you felt the conversation went. Um, anything that you would like to share with us, we're happy to consider that as we move forward. I also wanna just give a brief shout out to um, Kim Lee, who supports all of our speaker series um, on the back end. Um, you do an incredible job and we're grateful for your work um, and your engagement with us this evening. So thank you everyone. Um, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your night. <laughs>